My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows with Dan Burkholder, Peter Crow, Brigitte Maddox, and Jeff Shiwi. You'll also find links to previous conversations there. If you know of a photographer you'd like to see on the show, please send us both an introduction email. My guest today is Tony Lovejoy. Tony has been a sports photographer, a fashion photographer, and a documentary photographer. Here today to talk about a project that is both personal and painful. Please welcome Tony Lovejoy. Hey there, how are you doing? I'm well. It's been good sitting here talking to you before <laughs> this so that my nerves could just, you know, calm down. So I'm just going to attempt to be very transparent and genuine rather than presentation mode. Mm -hmm. So what's this past year been like with the whole pandemic thing for you? Um, you know, initially it was really quite easy for Natalia and I. Natalia is my 18 year old daughter, also the uh, main subject of the series. And, you know, we had traveled for a year around the US in a scamp trailer we had gotten used to being in a 64 square foot space. We had gotten used to being a community of two. And so at the beginning of the lockdown, we just thought, okay, this is, this is our life. This is normal. Um, I had a number of shows canceled, three canceled. One was a super cool installation I was looking forward to. Another I was looking forward to at Penn Center in um, South Carolina, um, the historic first African-American school for freed slaves that had started in 1861. I was going to be able to stay in Martin Luther King's retreat house that had been built for him. and. So for me, that was like the highlight of my whole life. And uh, that was canceled. Um, then I was doing another installation where I was going to um, build a slave cabin inside of the room that I had been given in a large um, art house, collective kind of space. And um, hang the portraits and put the family uh, genealogy on the wall and that was canceled. Wow. Um, yeah, so, and then, you know, with galleries, they have schedules two years out, a year out. And so I don't know whether I'll be back in the lineup again or not. So I, I'm just trying to figure out how to um, create new opportunities for those things. Um, and then towards the end, right now, like January was a super hard month as work sort of slowed down. It, you know, all of a sudden I got in my head too much and depression started hitting. My family mm -hmm. started being impacted. My brother has COVID. My best friend's father-in-law had passed away. Everything with the election, all of us became overwhelmed and almost non-functioning. I stopped creating art, uh, just, yeah. So it was kind of a um, pull myself up out of the mud in Meyer. Wow. So why don't we fill people in on your project? Uh, give us a little background on it and yourself. So, right, I am, I started shooting, I'm 57 years old and I started shooting um, when I was in the ninth grade, um, I became a photographer because of what had taken place in my life. I had, um, my mother and father were, um, it, when they got divorced, my father's black, my mother's white. And, uh, she moved us to a small town in Iowa, Fort Dodge, Iowa, and we were the mixed kids and what was essentially an all black neighborhood. And I was in like the first grade and I would get beat up every single day or every other day. Most of my, my siblings would get beat up and uh, we would stay after school, and wait for all the kids to get home so that we could run home safely it didn't always happen that way. And during recess, I'd be in fights. 
And so the teacher put me in the library Hi. to um, protect me. Yeah, but I and I while I was in the library, uh, I came upon a Gordon Parks book. And I thought at that point, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, he used words as well as his um, photography. I mean, you guys already know that. And I thought this is what I want to do in the seventh grade. I got my first um, camera by the ninth grade. I had my first job at a newspaper. I mean, I was bold, right? I went into <laughs> the newspaper and, you know, I want to be a photographer. I want to work for you. And the editor, bless his heart, in this small town in Iowa, the city was quite racist, gave me a job shooting things about town. Um, so I started shooting from there, moved off to Australia, shot fashion over there, came back to the States, interned with a photographer, was paid $100 a week, um, supporting a five-year-old child after I had gotten divorced, and then um, stopped shooting for about 10 years and then picked it back up again in 2008 and did uh, landscape and fine art, fine art landscape, not fine art in this genre. Um, so this series, while I had stopped shooting and when I picked it back up, I started doing a documentary because I worked in film and commercial. I started doing a documentary of my dad um, and his story and I started researching our genealogy and it, it was a very difficult thing to research it. Um, I was stuck at 1865 and um, I couldn't get past that year in terms of finding out who our family was. So a couple of years went on, I started visiting plantations. I wasn't really, um, happy when I would visit the plantations, but I was photographing on them. Um, and my daughter would say to me, why do you even go to these? You start out, you go in, you're happy. And by the time you leave, you're angry. And it was because as I would walk through these plantations that, you know, they're beautiful, they're well kept, they're telling the story, but they're telling a half story and they're hiding the truth. They're hiding what it was built on, what the money, where the money came from. Um, and, you know, I would interrupt the um, tour guide and say, that's not true. What about this? You're calling them servants. They were slaves. You're, you know, and, and she would try to hush me up and <laughs> Natalia would move me out, mom, mom, and pull on my arm. Um, anyway, I, uh, I took one photograph on the plantation that you'll see in a while where Natalia had, um, I was shooting the girl in the red beret series that I had started when, um, my parents died, my mother, my father, my grandmother all had died in a matter of two years. And so I started doing this red beret series representing me as an orphan um, and being alone in the world. And it was just my way of processing it. So I was going to shoot her in the red beret on the plantation. I started out with one image where she was in the cotton field and, and she was reflected in it. You'll see that image in a sec. And the one though, she's, in a, she's running from the slave cabin to the main house. I photographed that and it moved me at the time, but I didn't know how to process it. I didn't know what to do with it. So for six years, it just sat in my archives and I would pull the image up and I would think there's something to this. There's a way of treating this image, and, but I didn't know how to do it. Well. Fast forward to Photo Plus Expo in New York and Jeff Dunas is reviewing my work and um, he's telling me, you don't know how to print your work. You need to understand how to print your work. And, you know, he said uh, many relevant things, but that stuck with me. I thought, I don't know how to use the tools of my trade. I knew how to work in the dark room. I knew how to do all these other things 
but I didn't know how to maximize my images and tell my story the way I wanted to tell it. So I spent a good year just immersed in um, tutorials, Creative Life, which is where I saw our good friend, John. Um, and I paid as much attention to John in those episodes as I did everything else. I just thought this guy knows everything. Um, so I spent a good, at least a thousand hours in Photoshop. And then um, the light factory here in North Carolina had, um, had, a, had a workshop that they were going to do when they were pulling women together to do this uh, group called Beyond the Borders. So I submitted to it, didn't get in it. And a number of women artists didn't get into it. So a couple of us were like, you know what? I don't care whether I got into it. What I cared about was that collective and that group of women artists supporting one another, reviewing the work. And so we formed our own group and um, we had to create a new series. So that photograph that I took in um, 2012, I pulled up and I started working on that. The portrait that you see behind me of my daughter, I had taken and I pulled that up. Before I get too far into all of that, the essence of this series is taking my daughter in landscape form and having her touch, having her walk through the touchstones of slavery. Right, I've been on multiple plantations. She's walking through plantations. She's walking through plantation churches. She's walking past the trees where slaves were hung. She's in front of slave cabins. Um, and then I started doing portraits beginning with her that represent my ancestors that represent that story of um, from the first person that I could find or as far back as I could go with was Esther down through my oldest daughter and grandson that image is called Passing for White. So I'm gonna read you because I'm just running off at the mouth here and in, in, not necessarily, but the, the statement so that it makes more sense and is a little more comprehensive for you is this. A citizen of no nation, an ongoing photographic series, so I'm only halfway through it, begins the work of exploring and representing the history of slavery within my genealogical family line and the ongoing impact it has had on our contemporary lives. I began the work to deconstruct this shared history both as a descendant of the enslaved and the slave owner by photographing my daughter on various plantations and other touchstones of enslavement. Realizing that the images we've always been shown throughout history were images created by those who viewed us as chattel. I created portraits of my family and friends representing our mutual ancestors. This allowed me to humanize the faces of our hidden history while contrasting it starkly against the inhumane words and abuses of the enslaved economic system. I endeavor to revisualize and expose our ancestors' inner truth and their divine grace. Within these images, I sh sought to show beauty, strength, and courage, whereas we've only ever been shown the disenfranchised, the downtrodden, beaten, and abused. No one ever thought to show us that once we were warriors, a proud and beautiful people. The visual narrative was chosen for us, right? Someone else told our story. So I chose differently. I chose to show strength instead of defeat, beauty instead of destruction, and the richness of courage rather than the poverty of abuse. So that's sort of the opening statement of that. Cool, do you wanna With share something now? Yeah, so what I'm going to show you guys now is um, I had to do last year, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I 
was um, I had been hired to go to um, Indianapolis to show my work and do a presentation on this, but the um, pandemic happened. And so I had to create a slideshow to give the experience of walking through the show and then a presentation afterwards. So I'm gonna show you the slideshow um, now, and there's music that goes with it. and some heartache and pain and I laid on the ground and I looked up at the sky and I prayed to the Lord up above and asked why but oh no I'm not tired I'm not through marching yet and I'm marching till I die oh children this you can bet so we say I'm gone sing out and I'm gonna march on and everybody say I'm, I'm gonna sing out gonna march on I'm gonna march on gonna put one foot in front of the other foot I'm yes I am And I never thought it'd be something that I have to do. But I'll march if I must. I got a mission, you see. And I'll be damned if my children have to march for me. Now I believe in the power of raising my voice. And I believe in the power of of making some noise now if i die i can't sing and if i can't sing i'll die so we should sing for one another now let's give it a try so we say i Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Extraordinary. Thank very you. powerful. And by the way, your daughter is beautiful. That's very Thank powerful. Thank you. There are three of my daughters in that series. Oh, fabulous. So, um, you know, what's funny is 
every time I see those images, every time I sit with that music, I start hurting all over again. And it, it's very interesting to me that even now in talking to you, I'm always shocked that I start feeling the pain of this again. Um, when John asked me to do the talk, I, um, I, I actually refused to, um, oh, well, I said yes, I didn't refuse John. Anything John ever asked me to do, I'm going to say yes. Don't go there. Um, <laughs> don't go, don't go there. Um, but I, um, I, I refuse to look at my papers. I refuse to look at my writings. I refuse to look at the images um, until I had to, uh, because it puts me in this very um, heavy place, very burdened place. When, um, when I prepared for the show last year, to give the talk, like this isn't necessarily the talk that I give in a, at, a, at a university or in a show, it's just kind of talking about putting it together. Um, we did not celebrate Christmas, right? Because to do the story, to find the writings, to place documents on it, I'm spending eight to 10 hours a day reading slave narratives, reading documents, everything. And um, I get so deeply wounded by it that I, I couldn't step out of it to celebrate Christmas. I couldn't even feel a place of joy. And I felt that I was um, holding the words of my ancestors, that I was holding the words of my parents, of my grandmother, um, and I, and until I could give voice to their story, I couldn't speak my own again. I couldn't speak my own joy until I had spoke their pain. Um, so the minute I was done with the show, I took, um, I put all the Christmas stuff up. I bought presents and, you know, Natalia came home from school and the tree was set up and presents were under it and lights were all around the house. And my grandson came over and, and we had Christmas January 26th. So yeah, I can breathe again now. <laughs> so I'll let John ask questions. Oh, I don't really have a lot of questions for you. I mean, I, I want right. the audience to talk to you. This is a conversation. Um, what are people feeling from this? I have several questions. Um, first, it, it's, it was an, it's an incredible piece. No, no doubt about it. How did you, um, where's the music come from? Right, um, that music, you know, I know we all have a love-hate relationship with Facebook, with social media in general, um, but someone had posted that song um, a, a, a two years ago or something, and I had saved it, and the first time I heard it, I played it on repeat about 20 times, <laughs> and, and I felt empowered by it, and I felt strengthened by it. And um, so I tried to record it and finally, you know, I just flat out bought it. And I'm looking now to, um, to, to buy rights to it, not, you know, so that it can be part of the a proper display. Um, I'm, I'm thinking unless, I mean, you guys can ask questions, but I was going to pull up and talk about how I made the images. So you guys tell me where you want to go from here. Yeah, well, actually, questions. looking at you right now, you've got this gigantic print behind you. What is the size of that? Um, this one here goes up to the ceiling. Don't look at the floor, people. <laughs> Down. Um, it is six foot wide by nine foot printed on a chiffon cloth. And that was for a, um, a display, uh, uh, an installation that I did with a poet. Um, 
Dia, and they were hanging throughout um, this space and you walked through them. And the concept was that we were walking amongst our ancestors. And then he did spoken word poetry through it. The images were then also going to be hanging um, at a church, I'll show you, um, for the Penn Center, where they were going to be hanging, suspended from an open ceiling in a abandoned church building that was on a plantation. Um, that was going to be the entry to the show. Mm -hmm. Why did you go to Australia? <sighs> For love. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, say no more. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. also why I left Australia for lack of love. <laughs> <laughs> and so, how did you finance? How did you finance this 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 uh, project of yours? Um, you know what? By my pocketbook, because I didn't really, I didn't know what I was doing um, when I was doing it, and I'll go more into that. Um, one of my friends said to me that this story came about by listening to my ancestors, like the voices. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert, you know, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Uh -huh. She also wrote um, Big Magic. And in her book, she, she said that, um, you know, the universe gives you these stories and either you answer the call to tell the story or that story is going to find someone else to tell the story. Um, and I had that happen when my parents died. I photographed them as they were dying. It was the only way that I could process this loss to walk through it. So much so that my father who was being cremated when we went to the cremation place to sort of say our last goodbyes and they rolled him out and he was frozen and he had icicles on his hair, I photographed it. Mm -hmm. um, because you guys all know that once we put the camera up, we become observers rather than participants. And I felt like I was going crazy with the loss of my parents. So I kept thinking, I want to do this for other people not photograph their dead people, but um, to, um, to tell those stories of loss. And I kept sitting with it and sitting with it and I didn't do it. And lo and behold, if this photographer that I met at Palm Springs Photo Festival, and I never told him about it, is now doing that story and photographing people in hospice. And I hate him for it, but I love him too, so. <laughs> Um, so that, that this story has been telling itself and that's why it takes me so long to do it. Um, one of the images I'll pull up, um, I sat with that image for a year. The first image of the series I sat with for six years. Um, Natalia's image, this first portrait series started out with one iteration, um, and Bob Carey's wife, do you guys know Bob Carey? The Tutu, the Tutu Project? Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. And his wife is brilliant. And she saw it. And, you know, she was the first person to say that image is everything. And, you know, we see our own work and we don't think about it. But I thought about the image of Natalia and her speaking to me. So let me jump in and, and show you guys these things rather than um, talking on things you can't see. And interject at any point as I'm going through, ask questions, because anyone on here who knows me knows I'll just talk and <laughs> talk and talk. Yeah, Jim, so. Jim kind of summed it up saying he's having trouble putting together questions because he's overwhelmed by the power, power of the experience you created. Thank you. I'm going to try not to cry anymore. So <laughs> we'll start there. All right, let me um, share my screen again. And, um, and, you know, you guys, I am going to read you some of the words, the, the slave narratives um, that impacted me because they're really what the whole thing is about. Um, contrasting beautiful images with the harshness of the system itself, 
right? And what I had said at the beginning, I'll tell you this before I show you the images. So when we go to them, I want you to sit with that. So I had my portfolio review in Palm Springs and I was showing this work and um, I was showing it to one gallery that I was so excited for him to view the work and his words to me as he went through the images, now this is gonna make me choke up again, um, was I had romanticized slavery and that black women were not this beautiful. They were beautiful, oh but they weren't male gaze beautiful. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, uh, why do you think that they were raped? And he said, these people were beasts. They would have raped a dog. And I sat through this, um, you know, and then he, you know, he went on again to tell me that I was romanticizing slavery. And at that point, I said, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. I don't need you, a white man, to tell me, a black woman, what slavery was and what the experience of it was. Like, you've told our story for us long enough. Like, I'm telling the story. Um, and I said it sort of respectfully when I was speaking to Maggie Stever later. She's like, I would have gotten up and left. I was like, it, you know, it, it was good for me to hear that. It was good for me to hear those words that typically aren't spoken. Like, I don't know that he thought I was black and there's that whole thing, right? The title of the show is A Citizen of No Nation. I'm neither white. I'm not ever gonna fit into the white world. I'm not 100% black and, you know, I hear the passing or the sellout or, you know, you have this hair versus that hair. Um, you have light privilege, um, colorism. So it, it's quite difficult to find my place on stage. And I have likened it now to, it's a bridge, right? So there's white over here and there's black over here, full black. And then literally here I am in the middle and I can speak to this experience over here, not all the way because there's still more experience that a full black person will experience, but I've experienced the cross burnings in the yard. I've experienced the um, boy breaking up with me because um, his dad told him you're not dating an N word, right? I've experienced that being called every name in the book, the town that I grew up in um, was a sundown town. Not, not, I went to high school in this town and that town every day going on the bus um, into school was a sign no blacks allowed after sundown. Every day of my high school experience. Um, and then just recently that same town, they have a, a town Facebook. They denied the existence of this sign and I cannot even begin to tell you the impact that had on me for someone to tell me that what I experienced hadn't actually happened because they, they, they were trying to hide the story because now this town that was all white except for me now was a town of mixed children, right? The very people who would not let their kids play with me now had grandchildren that looked like me. And so, you know, they were trying to whitewash that story and it became a big, big deal. Um, anyway, so a yeah. Question, um, just a real quick question. And you, you live in North Carolina? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And, you know, I mean, Obviously, there, there are Black people here, and there's a long history here. There's a very strong Black community here. Um, I mean, strong community here. But still, I'm very conscious when I drive the back roads of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, I cannot pass a field or pass a large tree 
and not see my ancestors running through the woods, hiding or being beaten or being hung from a tree. Not a day goes by that I don't see those images in my head. I'm next week driving to Florida and I'm, while I'm talking to you guys, I'm gonna share the screen. Um, I'm driving to Florida and um, I'm worried about the back roads, right? I'm worried about certain areas of Florida and I'm praying fervently that my car doesn't break down because there's a part of me that's afraid. And I am a woman that generally lives without fear or I, I feel the fear, I do it anyway kind of thing. Um, but this is, this is a period of time where, you know, I wish I was married. I wish my husband were driving and coming with me. I don't often wish I was married, but that's, <laughs> a, this is, a time. <laughs> this is a time. Okay. Let me share. Um, let me start with, you know what, I, I had it, I'll start with this one. This image here, I don't know how well you can see it on your screen. I'm gonna enlarge it a little bit. Um, I'm gonna zoom in a bit. Sorry guys. It's okay. While you're doing that, Jerry was asking if you would talk a little bit about the writings that go with your photos. Yes, sir. And, and the coincidence to. that the, the ad that I put together to promote this, I put the writing over the, the image too, and I had not seen any of her work in that form. Isn't that crazy? I, <laughs> I thought, wow, so brilliant of you. Okay, so this image here, the writing that's on it, I, I should um, talk about how the images were made. And I'm really going out of order again because I'm not in a formalized presentation. When I shoot the portraits, um, they come into my studio, which I'm sitting in now. That's a disaster because nobody comes into our house anymore. Um, they're sitting, um, it's all natural lighting and they're sitting in a, um, in, in a V flat, right? It's a black V flat and they have to sit perfectly still. I'm shooting with a Nikon, a lens baby is on it. Um, it's only focused on her eye. Um, it's a three hour session. I play Nina Simone music, um, Strange Fruit Hanging from the Tree mm -hmm. or another song depending on what's happening. I read a slave narrative and we sit in silence. The camera is focused. And so for her in particular, I tell her she is now going to be sold. So to, you know, close your eyes, visualize that um, you're about to be sold. You're with your mother. Your mother has been sold. She's standing off to the side. You are now on the auction block. Your clothing is stripped down. You're bare breasted and the prices being called out for you. And she opened her eyes and you can see the tears that are there. And she sat perfectly still and just wept as strange fruit hanging from a tree was playing. And once I start um, with telling her, you know, this is the premise, that's it, I don't speak anymore. And I just click and sometimes they move and sometimes they don't move. Um, the same, um, I'm gonna go from that. I'm gonna come back to um, the similarities that each of the images have. This image, let me come out of Zoom, is my daughter. Um, and even though this is a portrait or it, it fits the portrait portion of the show, she is not standing up. So photographing her, um, I took her pictures in September and um, I didn't do anything with it for almost a year because she was sick when I shot it. And, and you know, my middle daughter and I, we have a, a tumultuous relationship. 
So sometimes how she was looking at me I was not really happy with. Um, but also, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of hurt in her eyes that I couldn't see past. And, and she kept resisting the shoot, the session. And so then she, she had cramps and she laid on the floor like this. And um, every time I pulled that image up, it spoke to me. And so the reason I didn't do anything with it is because I was putting over it words of rape by Harriet Jacobs. And to put images over my child that spoke to rape was torture for me, torture. Um, so I, um, I didn't do it until I had to do it. All right, let me just back up and tell, show you the beginning image, which is this one. Whoops, good night, nurse. <laughs> Do that, go back. Let me not touch things. Unzoom it. Okay, so this is Natalia and I started, this, this was taken in 2012 on Boone Hall Plantation. This is the main house and these are, um, the um, slave cabins. What was very bizarre, very quickly, was um, in one of these, they had a TV. And I have this photograph where you see the TV, you see the house, and um, Obama is in the White House. And that image itself was, for me, quite profound but Natalia being here in the middle. So she doesn't have the red beret on. Um, she has the dress on that, that is in this entire series, um, but she has a, a wrap on that I wore. She has a hat on that I wore. And this is the one that every time I came to it, I thought there was something to it. And so when I finally started layering these images, there are five layers on these images. Um, and I'll show you um, some of those layers. I created, I, I did it, I put words on it, not these words, but another one. And the minute, the minute the image came together, I started crying and my stomach was in knots and I, I got scared and I closed my computer screen and I didn't touch the image again. I, I was, I went to bed and I was just, you know, as we say, I was in my feelings and I couldn't figure out what it was. I just knew that I was afraid of the work. And so I didn't show it to anybody. Well, backing up to, um, the Light Factory and the Collective of Women, we started our group, called it the Aperture Collective. And I had to start showing my work to them. Everybody would show work and everybody would comment on it, but I would not show this work at all. Um, again, because I was afraid, again, because it wasn't, um, it wasn't like my normal stuff. Um, and I didn't know how I felt about it. I didn't think I could bear someone else saying something about it. So the women let me get away with it for a while, but um, the last day uh, before we had to start making other decisions, they're like, all right, Lovejoy, you've got to show this work. And so I put it out and um, my hands were shaking. I mean, as I'm putting the sheet down, my hands are trembling and it's dead silence in the room. Two women, you know, cry, not sobbing, but you know, they get emotional. And um, so that, that's kind of how it began um, with, that, with that support. Um, this is the image that I told you about that's not in the series. This is Natalia walking through the cotton fields. And you can see here um, that I had overlaid two images, um, historical image of, of 
actual slaves in the cotton field. Um, but there's a premise for me for each image that I create. If it doesn't hurt me, if it doesn't make me cry, then I, I don't feel, I, 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 I don't use it. It, it. it has to meet that marker. It has to hurt me. Um, whether it hurts you or not, this can sound bad, <laughs> is not relevant, so good. right? Because we're <laughs> doing our work for ourselves. And if it resonates with someone else, that's amazing. But I cannot, when I came off the road um, traveling around the US and I started selling the work from there and doing it at art festivals and farmers markets, people started asking me, you know, do you have a picture of this? Do you have a picture of that? And I started shooting for them to make sales. And so I stopped doing the, the festivals for that reason because I thought I am not a market photographer. I always shoot with emotion. I'm not a technical oh. shooter. I have to just shoot what I feel. So um, this is an image before anything was done to it. Um, this is at the Penn Center in, in South Carolina. And this is the church where the, um, the large nine foot ceiling um, or the nine foot hangings were going to be displayed. The thing would have been lit by candles. You can see Natalia here um standing and walking through it um, ask a question yes please please so you stopped selling individual prints of your work um no i i didn't stop selling i stopped going to um farmers markets and um art festivals because I, I like them and I like meeting people and I like introducing my work, but it was shifting the way I thought about my work. It, it, it shifted my mind to shoot for people rather than to shoot how I felt. But and your so images are still being presented yes. at, at these events. At art shows, right? Okay. So yep. at, at a gallery. Um, but no longer where, you know, people just rifle through your work and, you know, oh, do you have an image of this? And I'm not minimizing that because I made, I paid bills that way. <laughs> yeah. Right. You can't, you can't complain about that at all. It just, I needed to shoot from the heart. Um, I, I stopped sharing for a yeah. second so I could see your face. Um, and I can pause for Don't a bother. second if anyone <laughs> has questions. Well, one question came up to me is the Red Beret you mentioned a few times. Is that tied into this project or is that another project or how does it overlap? It's, it's entirely separate. The only way it came into play is, you know, how Natalia um, became the essence of the series, mm -hmm. right? She's in every single landscape image, you know, that's a broad shot on a plantation um, because, because she's my child and she had to travel wherever I traveled and she had to do whatever I said to do. Um, and, and so um, we were doing the Red Beret thing. I'm gonna pop back into sharing you guys. Um, we were in the middle, come on, there we go. I'm gonna get out of this one on multiple context sheets. Let me show you um, one particular one, this one here. This image, I think she's nine or eight years old. And we are outside of um, Charleston. We're in a backwoods area. We are on a plantation that we needed permission to get on. And I had done my research and I, you know, the work that I do now, I think because my parents died, I'm 100% tied into my past. I mean, I live in the present, I look to the future, but I'm engaged with 
the shoulders that we stand on. I am super conscious of um, the icons that came before me and that I need to tell their stories. And so I look for their stories. So um, we are, I'm researching, I've called the owner, I've stopped at people's houses and they've said, you know, here's who you need to call. I'm calling them. I'm at the gates to the entrance to this plantation. And the overseer of it says, no, you can't have access for all these reasons. Well, as we're leaving, someone comes out of the gates and it is the baby of the family, this dude who's the wild child and he's with his girlfriend and they're in an open-ended Jeep. And he's like, hey, what are you doing? And so I tell him and he's like, heck yeah, come on in. And he doesn't like his brother. And um, so he's gonna rebel against him. And so he drives us in and he leaves us there. I mean, oh. we have complete access to this building, which you'll see. And so in this image, I'm going to zoom in here, this right here, this person's name here, John C. Adamson, and this name right here, Sylvie, a girl about eight years of age. The document that's on this image is my ancestors. It's my great, great, great grandmother. Sylvie is my great, great, great grandmother. And this is her labor contract. It's 1865. Let's see, June the 12th, 1865. And she and her brother, Charlie, are contracting themselves to the former owner, John Adamson, who also happens to be her father. Oh, man. And yeah, it, when the DNA verification came for that, again, I, I cried. It was, it was like, I didn't want to, I didn't want that to be a reality. So, um, you know, the image that I showed you before of my daughter with um, Harriet Jacobs words on it um, about rape, come to find out there's no slave that's having relationships with the slave owner that isn't rape. There, there's, there's no asking permission. There's no falling in love. There's just rape. And to, to have that be part of my story was painful. I reached out to that family, you know, um, in our, um, in Ancestry 23, I, contacted one of them and she reached out to me and I was asking for documentation, any of the um, slave schedules that they had and her words were, um, our family didn't have slaves. Mm. And I said, I beg to differ because I am a descendant of one of your family's slaves. And I have the paperwork to show you from that end and um, she never contacted me again. She stopped writing. And I was like, look, I wasn't asking to go to your family picnic. I just wanted <laughs> the information. Um, so in this image as well, let me go in. Hey, there Tony, I have is... a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. What was your family's reaction? I know you're no longer around, but what was your family's reaction and how did you, and it's great to hear this from a firsthand uh, person's family, how did you react to both sides? And I'm not sure if you've had any follow-up with the owners. Yes. Um, let me show you something real quick to answer that question. Um, let me take you one, two, three. Okay, right here, let me go back one. All right, so this is the family tree, right? Um, right here 
is Seaborne Lovejoy, born 1805. I'm way down here, right? This is Seaborne and that's where it stops, 1805. Over here, here's Sylvie Adamson, um, who this is the only picture that I have of her, that this is the child, the eight-year-old child. Um, this is her. I know I'm dwelling on that and, and I've paused here, but it's because I don't know her, but I love her. Um, I, all of a sudden I feel emotional again, but let me just, let me just go over here. Okay, so here we go over Sylvie, John Adams. This is Esther Adams, who is also on that labor contract that I showed you, um, or that's on that picture. So it goes up. Okay, so now this is one line up above Seaborn, right? Well, the next slide for, C, for, for um, John C. Adamson is five more layers up, five more layers up. And then you see this little black dot here, there's two more layers up. So that's a total of seven. Now my mother, how my family reacted. So 1805 for my dad's side, my mother's side, I can go back to the 1500s. And I went back to the 1500s in two hours. That's how easy it was to track her family lineage. And um, so some of my siblings, there are 11 of us, haven't seen the show, haven't seen all the work that you've seen. Um, my daughters, of course, have, and, and they've had to live it as I've walked through it. So they stay pretty distant from it. They don't necessarily engage. People don't like hearing the words, and I'm going to read you some of the words because they hurt. Um, so I kind of, I, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term, the sin eater, um, but I kind of feel like that, like, like I'm absorbing, I'm taking all of the pain in to present it in a way that everyone can live with it. And I don't expect you to live with it and walk away, that's beautiful, but live with it and, and, and be able to, to absorb it or to begin to absorb it, right? I don't want to, I didn't want to slap anyone in the face. I didn't want to holler at anybody because you know the minute people start hollering, ears closed, people shut down. I needed this to be a conversation. I needed to be transparent, but within my own family, you know, my mother is gone. Um, and I found I could not celebrate her history because I couldn't know my father's history. And, um, that makes me emotional again. I felt that until I could celebrate and get his story, I couldn't celebrate hers. And that doesn't mean that I've pushed my mother to the curb. I am definitely who I am because of her. Um, I mean, I am who I am uh, art-wise because my dad, but whatever. Um, so um, my white ancestors, or uh, relatives, they haven't seen it. Um, one in particular during all the Trump issues, the race um, last year, the BLM movements, I had to block her um, because she is still of my mother's family who, um, who used the N-word, who rejected my mother, who rejected us, who is still talking about Black people as if they are less than, who still embraces white supremacy. And at the same time, because my father was famous, she wants to connect to that. And she wants to say, you know, all these great things. And in the same breath, use the N-word and talk about other people. So there's, there's, 
it, within my own head, there's a dichotomy, there's a split personality um, that goes with it. So uh, we don't always get to educate our own family because there's a, a lot of family dynamics. Um, yeah, Jeff was asking that. in the chat though, um, how did Trump's 1776 report affect you? And what do you feel about the 1619 project? Good night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it you can curse it's okay no, to curse no no, no, no I, you can I, curse. I, I, if there are, there are people who know me well and know i don't curse um one time i did stand in a room by myself and say all the curse words just <laughs> to see what that felt like and i was like wow that f word feels kind of good sometimes um it has a it has a <laughs> feel on the lips like front door, shut the front door. Um, anyway, uh, I, I don't have a feeling about it. I resented Trump's uh, desire to um, forget the 1619 project, to dismiss that, to belittle it, to minimize it. Um, but everybody has to, you know what I'm just going to say? I don't have a feeling about it. I do have yeah. a feeling about it, but I don't have it formulated in a way that makes sense that I'm not going to stumble on my words. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. We can go back to you. All right. Let me, um, there's so much to show you guys. And I, you know what I'm going to do? This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> And you know, I know I'm gonna have friends of mine later that are gonna say, you know, you did good on this, but you should have done this. <laughs> it's always easy to look back. Right, okay, this is looking weird right now. Okay, so uh, the making of the portraits, I told you guys that, you know, how each session happens, but something else to be aware of is that each image, they all have the same silk head wrap. They all have the same pearls, the pearl earrings, and the same dress, right? Uh, everything, they wear the same. Um, so it was kind of important. I couldn't, I couldn't get a model that um, was heavier than the dress would fit. Now I did photograph some and the back of the dress is clamped because it wouldn't close. Um, but the dress is an antique, it has tears in it. The pearls came from my grandmother, the head wrap I bought. Um, the idea was that these are all family. This is handed down. And the only difference that was allowed was each person individually wrap the scarf around their hair. And that is, you know, the slaves were required to cover their hair. And so it was a form, it was a personal statement, how they did it. And so if you look at each portrait, um, they, um, they all have their hair wrapped differently. That what's underneath, you know, the glory is hidden and so that was their personality all right this right here is from willie lynch and it's a contested historical writing but it's super relevant and um it's relevant because when you read the entire thing you begin to understand the impact that slavery had on the black community and again, a disclaimer here is that I cannot claim to speak. I am not the voice of our entire community. I'm only, you know, speaking from how I've interpreted the work, how I've internalized it, and what I have gained as a result of it. So, for instance, this word here, which I will never say again. Um, I used to say, my whole family said it, my father said it. Um, and, and you know that within the black community, we all say it and, and white people will say, how come you can say it and I can't say it. And I bet some of you are thinking, I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask that, but I didn't wanna ask that. So I'm telling you. Um, 
what I what I say to that now and again, this is only for me. This is a this is a slave master word. This is not my word. This is not my family word. I consider this word to be like a pig. And you can put lipstick on a pig, you can dress it up, you can put heels on it. I doubt it could walk, but you get my point. But it's still going to be a pig. Here is um, here's here's a description of uh, written. This was written in 1837. Um, and the name of the the writing is called "A Treatise on the Intellectual Character and Civil and Political Condition of the Colored People of the United States and the Prejudice Exercised Toward Them" in 1837. Hosea Easton wrote that, I'm gonna say Negro, you'll know what the other word is, wrote that Negro is an opprobrious term employed to impose contempt upon blacks as an inferior race. The term in itself would be perfectly harmless were it used only to distinguish one class of society from another, but it is not used with that intent. It flows from the fountain of purpose to injure. Easton averred that often the earliest instruction white adults gave to white children prominently featured the word. Adults reprimanded them for being worse than, for being ignorant as, having no more credit than. And so, um, I, I've decided for me personally, um, the great love of my life, um, Armin had said, you know, Martin Luther King lived and died so that that word would not be said. And it, it didn't resonate with me at the time. I was of the mindset, this is our word, this is family to family, but I'm of the mindset that we have to change the narrative when we have to choose our own words. We did not choose this word. It was chosen for us. And therefore I will not carry on that baggage and try to paint it or dress it up or make it my own. That's no different than a rape victim becoming friends with her rapist and calling him family. Like, I, I can't do it anymore. And I never understood that until I worked on this project. Okay, I'll pause for a second if you have a question or I'll continue on. Okay, this here, um, you, you, you can read it yourself, but um, what's relevant in this, we reverse nature by burning and pulling a civilized Negro apart and bullwhipping the other to the point of death, all in the presence of the woman. By her being left alone unprotected with the male destroyed, the ordeal caused her to move from her psychological dependent state to a frozen independent state. In this frozen psychological state of independence, she'll raise her male and female offspring in reverse roles. For fear of the young male's life, she will psychologically train him to be mentally weak, independent, but physically strong. Because she has become psychologically independent, she will train her female offspring to be psychologically independent. This writing is contested, historical, um, but to me, it doesn't matter. It explains so, so much about our community, about the thoughts that people have about our community. And just going back to that family lineage and being able to, um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second, being able to, to, um, to go this high with my mother's, but only this far with my father's, unless I went to the white side and I could go further. That's 400 years difference. In that 400 years, if you think of it like luggage, over here is not just one suitcase, it's trunks and trunks and bags 
full of information, full of knowledge, full of rights and privileges and understandings that were passed down, right? So every generation passed down more, whether it was land, money, inheritance, but knowledge, knowledge was the key. And then you take over here and you take the slave knowledge and, and you have an empty suitcase. What you have there is an entire history wiped out. I can't find where Seaborn Lovejoy came from. I don't know who his parents were. I don't know what land in Africa he came from and Ancestry 23 or DNA, whatever, Ancestry.com. They can now tell me you're this percentage of Nigerian and there's this whole other block of Africa that you get slotted into, but it doesn't tell you who you were. My mother's, I have baptismal records from Bern, Switzerland. So my suitcase on my father's side is empty. My father, fourth grade education, his mother, zero education, they're sharecroppers. Her mother, you know, coming out of slavery, raised by a slave. And so, yes, slaves were intelligent, but what information did they have? My father, his entire life did not have a bank account his entire life. And um, I think of it uh, like Natalia when she was 10 years old. Let's say a 10 year old is now cut loose and has to live in the world. She has to figure out how to navigate in the world. How does a 10 year old navigate when all food was bought for her, clothes were bought for her, she was told what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And she was given one trait, you're the cook or you clean house. So she only knows how to clean house. So how does she, how does she then say when reading was illegal, um, knowledge was illegal, how does she then teach her children to read? And if schools aren't available, when does that become value to, to, to make that point without going on about it? Um, my grandmother who just passed away a couple of years ago, she was three months, three months shy of being 107 years old, which meant she was two years old when Harriet Tubman died. I just want you to let that sink in. I was touching the hand that touched these stories. We say often that it's, it's so far removed, but it was my grandmother who raised my father and my grandmother, her form of abuse, her form of discipline, <laughs> slip of the tongue, but still relevant. Her form of discipline for my father was to lock him in the woodshed. That was her punishment. Our punishment was whippings or beatings and you know white people don't beat their kids black folks we discipline and we discipline hard and you read Willie Lynch and you say is is that our heritage is that how we view discipline is that what we know and you have to wonder what I experience is generational trauma right? Our community is riddled with generational trauma. So even in a time now, and I know this is Black History Month, and I'm not talking about this because it's Black History Month. I didn't start this series because of um, the shootings that were going on. Remember 2012, this, this story has just been creating itself. Um, this this generational trauma is deeply embedded in our community. So when someone says black people have been given the same opportunities, I really need those of you who are listening to understand how not true that is. It's available now, but if your family doesn't value education, if you are not surrounded by that history, it's harder 
to make those inroads. It's harder to impress that if you don't know how. And here I, I consider myself somewhat smart, but um, my daughter who, just, you know, all of my daughters have gone to college. Um, Natalia is still in college, but there was something a good white friend of mine and, and mind you all, I'm super uncomfortable saying, you know, my white friend versus my black friend, that's not a normal part of my conversation. But she, her daughter was going to college at the same time. Her level of knowledge about how to navigate that, who to hire to help was so different than mine. So different that it, it really exposed me to the empty suitcases. My, my theory about the empty suitcases or what's in my luggage now is okay, we're first generation you know, college students. Um, we're first generation successful this or you know, first generation to own land, to have a bank account. Let that register, to have a bank account. First generation. Um, so, uh, I'll stop with that and breathe a minute before I just start, you know, going off on a tangent and come back to the photos and allow you all to ask questions or comment <laughs> if you have any. Yeah, take your time, breathe. Anyone? It's great to hear this, Tony, and I hope they appreciate it in North Carolina if you That's get right. to view your work because a lot of the issues that you're talking about are still issues. And like I said before, it's great to have first family knowledge of the things that you're bringing up in these photographs and the narrative that you have behind it is something everybody needs to hear and take the time to understand. Right, thank you for saying that, Seth. Was somebody gonna say something? Okay. Um, I'm saying powerful work, um, but I, and I don't mean to, um, not give it its importance, but I'm curious about your printing methods because I noticed they look like hand-coded paper prints. Yes, um, and, and Douglas, this conversation can go 20 different <laughs> directions and that's okay. You're not minimizing anything that I'm talking about. If, if we were in a presentation mode, nobody would even have a chance to ask questions until at the end. Um, so this isn't that forum. I, um, these prints are meant to be platinum palladium prints. There will be a series of them that will be platinum palladium. So um, yes, that is how it looks. I did the layers in Photoshop and I can go to share the screen and go to that. Um, the um, photos, I wanna show you the one. There are five layers of the images. Here we go. One of the layers on the image is this right here. This is a photograph that I took in 2014 of a slave cabin in Louisiana, the walls of the slave cabin. It's called Boussolage. Um, Boussolage is a mixture of horsehair, which you can see, mud, clay, um, a number of other things. That's one of the layers of it. There's a wet plate, a photograph of a wet plate um, layered on it. There's the historical words um, that were photographed that are layered on it. Um, let me show you. Um, so for instance, I might pull up if this, for the love, come on. All right, here we go. Um, this right here, I would have to convert that to black and white, pull the words off of it, and then that would also be layered on the image. Um, so I'll photograph the historical document or go to the Library of Congress and find one of those documents. And then you can see this is um, one of the layer or one of the images, the PSD file. And those are the number of layers that go in it. 
and all of that um, was to create uh, um, the digital file so that I could do a platinum palladium process with it. So you're making a digital negative to size. Yeah. Um, and I have a friend in the Aperture Collective, two women, Jane Wiley and Caroline Waterman, who are master printers in the um, process, and Diana Bloomfield. Some of you guys might be familiar. I have yet to take a workshop with her. Um, so I had to print them and create that. Like the border on the image is um, different photographs of different um, platinum palladium brush strokes, right? Or um... yeah, I do some alt printing myself, so that's what Yeah, so you understand the, yeah. yeah. This image here, I don't know why these aren't pulling up anymore. I'll open it this way. If Will Jones is on the, um, the call right now, I can hear him cringing because <laughs> I can't get my screen right. I just know it. I don't know why it's not coming up larger. Um, all right, let me just tell you. So this is this is photographed in South Carolina on um, this church property that has gates up, no trespassing, um, but you can, you know, the, the right side of it is wide open to the woods. So I, you know, came in from the side. I had Natalia go through the fence. So yes, we are trespassing. Um, Natalia is at this point in the series, she is 17, she's 17 years old. And it's on a back road, there's nobody around. We had been told about this location by two other photographers in the Aperture Collective, both white women. And the minute I saw the church building, it was first built for the family of the plantation, then they handed it over to the slaves. So then it became a slave church. And um, so they photographed it and I, want, I, I knew how important it was because that was a touchstone of the whole story of slavery, right? How the church was used, how could Christian um, condone slavery? And so we went down and I didn't know what I was going to put over it, right? Like I spend an exorbitant amount of time reading and sometimes the image talks to me and says, these are the words. Sometimes I'll read the words and the words, I know it sounds all, Namby Pamby esoteric, but the words sometimes tell me where they belong as well. So I didn't know what was going on this. Well, we're down there, we're shooting. There's many, many iterations of her going to the right, going to the left, coming towards the camera, etc. cetera. Um, and anytime she heard a car coming, she would run and get in the car. And then she got to the point where it was a fight. We were fighting. And she was like, I'm not doing this. I don't wanna do this. Please don't make me do this. And now she's 17, she's not 10. I can't make her do it. So I'm pleading with her yeah. and she's saying, I'm scared. I'm like, what are you scared of? These people went to it and they were fine. And this, her words struck me like I was slapped. And she said, yes, but they're white. We are not white. And we are here in these backwoods and anything can happen to us that will not necessarily happen to them. And I hadn't thought of it and, it and it struck me deeply that I had made my child feel unsafe in pursuit of the story. Um, and she said, that's it, I'm done. And um, we argued for a while, you know, we went to this plantation, we walked to a, um, a slave graveyard. And I don't know if you know this, but in slave graveyards, they're not named. There are no names, there's no gates, there's no protecting it. Um, and so I will be doing a photograph there and it will be entitled the unnamed bones of my ancestors. Um, 
but I told her, you know, there's a couple more that I need to shoot to finish that narrative. You know, there's an auction block on a plantation in Virginia that I want to photograph at. I want her standing on the auction block. Um, the Ku Klux Klan, you know, I want her in that, but I can't obviously shoot with the KKK. So I have to buy the costumes and there's a whole lot of fear with that. So the words on this image, again, it's a Bible that was for the use of the Negro slave, right? If I can figure out why I can't make this larger. Are you in Photoshop? Is it just com Command Plus? Will I that... am. My, um, my, my, my mouse is sort of freezing. Because hmm. it says it's at 100%, though. Right. And it's still going small. So I'm not sure what's happening on here. Um, it says um, Holy Bible for the use of the Negro slaves. And let me, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and maybe the stuff will come undone. Um, this, the Bible slaves was um, a lot of the words were cut out. The, a lot of the stories were cut out. The stories of, um, of the Israelites being freed, not in there. Any stories that talk about freedom are removed from this Bible and that's what they were given. So in the, in the presentation, um, I, I, I struggled, right? I'm a Christian and, and I struggled with putting God's words on a lie or allowing God's words to be used as a lie. Um, but when I discovered this book, you know, there's a museum for, um, for this um, and I can't think off the top of my head what it is called. Um, I, I got the, um, the JPEG files for it to use to put on this image. Um, do you guys have any questions? I'm going to share on have, my screen again. I have a couple. Yeah, Michael. I, I'm having, I'm having a difficult time understanding what the difference is between a regular Bible and a slave Bible, other than the fact that you're, that, that certain words and certain passages were ripped out. 60% of the Bible is missing. But, 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 but the 60% that's missing, is it in the regular Bible? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So take your Bible, take my Bible, remove 60% of it, that it was published so that there wasn't anything incendi incendiary. Well, I'm Jewish, so so they 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 they're not taking anything. Right, out you of have the, the Torah. The Torah, all right. And, oh no, and, no, they removed the Torah. They removed a great deal of the Torah as well, Michael. That like it's it's not you don't even get the first five books. Uh, assume oh, the what? Torah with no Exodus. Exactly. Part, okay. That's part of it. That's part yeah. of it. Yeah. But that's the example. But, mm -hmm. but, but do they talk about um, Ethiopian Jews or Sephardic Jews or Black people that are Jewish? No. And, you know, Michael, I can't really speak to their mindset, why they did it, what, I mean, we know why they did it, right? It yeah. was all about oppression. It was all about eliminating the concept that they had rights of freedom. It was all about fear. You know, of course, what was kept in it was slaves remain slaves, whatever state you're found in, you know, uh, that was kept and that was used. But um, the concept of you have rights as a human being, you are equal to was not kept. Well, it was also all about um, education and property and both 
both uh, um, blacks and Jews were never allowed in the past to own property or, or be educated. So that's that's Correct. a similarity. That's a similarity that 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 happens, uh, and why there's a propensity, for example, of Jewish lawyers, Jewish doctors, Jewish scientists, because all all all, all they had were were books to read from. They didn't have property. I'm wondering you also know, about wondering also about that that woman that you had a block from from your from your I guess your blog or whatever it was, uh, and your your related to her right in the ancestry right. page right where she where i had reached out to her yes yes okay, okay um, what's uh, your question uh, i'm also wondering whether or not she's totally blocking you out because she's concerned about property oh it, it, who knows uh, you're speaking maybe along the lines of reparations right no, going after no. inheritance oh you know what? Who knows? I mean, you know, it was more about, I don't think it really had anything to do with that, but this is me interpreting her motives. Okay. But I was only speaking about knowledge and gaining the slave schedules, gaining the family wills, because it's the wills that from the families that list the names, right? We knew the names of slaves, the owners knew their names, but on the slave schedules, they were not named. It was 45 year old MB, male black, 32 year old FM, female mulatto, or one year old, right? So I was looking for that information. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I have to go to courts and pull probates and pull all of that stuff. And sometimes people will say that the building burned or in, for, in the instance of the um, Adamson family in the Adamson um, plantation and the Lovejoy plantation in Alabama and Georgia, the land was flooded. And so as I try to get those records, you know, people are hiding the stories. Right. Right, absolutely and right. it, it yeah. just related to, you know, the Jewish story versus the black story. It's not a comparison, um, but there is a difference. There's a, a difference of history alone. Well, there's a, difference our between, his there's a difference between the black history and the white history. But in terms of Jewish, that's religion and blacks and whites are Jewish. A, a big contingency yeah. of blacks and whites are, are, are Jews and, right. came from, I, I'm not, and came from Africa. I'm not discounting that at all. No. And, I, and I understand your point with that. I'm simply saying that your story, you can, you can track it back. There aren't necessarily missing pages, but I must and Seth must and Terrell must, and if Cedric's on here, or, or Will Jones must, we must go from 1805 and take a flying leap and land in Africa and try to figure out which particular land do we come from, Ethiopia, Sudan, you know, Z Zambia, Namibia. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then when we get there, can we get everybody to take a DNA test to see where, where our dots are connected, right? So what I'm saying is yes, black Jews, Ethiopian Jews, but I've got to take a huge leap from 1805 to get to Ethiopia. I've got to take a huge leap from 1805 to place myself in a tribe because that history was destroyed. It was wiped out with intention, with intention. While um, within the Jewish history, some people's family lines definitely were wiped out. No minimizing that or, or any of that. Um, and, and some of we, us can't go, back, can't go back any further than, uh, I don't know, 19, 1932. For sure, right? Because okay. that story was wiped out. But Michael, the difference is some versus all. 
those two words are mm -hmm. key. Some of us versus all of us. That's a huge thing for an entire community to be blocked. And we call it uh, in research, the brick wall. We can't break down that brick wall. Somebody has to break it down from the other side. So for the white community, you know, who holds that information, it's important to share those stories. And I belong to groups where that is shared. I'm gonna um, go forward a little bit to that religion. I wanted to read you, this is from Sojourner Truth. Um, you guys, she wrote, Ain't I a Woman, right? Um, one of the things that she said was, and what is that religion that sanctions, even by its silence, all that is embraced in the peculiar, peculiar institution of slavery? If there can be anything more diametrically opposed to the religion of Jesus than the working of this soul-killing system, which is as truly sanctioned by the religion of America as are her ministers and churches. We wish to be shown where it can be found. Sojourner Truth, she was powerful in her, um, in her statements. Well, we've been going for 90, more than 90 minutes here. How are you holding up? Holy cow. <laughs> How what? How are you holding up? You know, this is this is a passion project for me. Um, it's a passion project, and, and there's and there's so much to it. Um, I can, but being conscious of everyone who's here and what their purpose might be in being here, I can either read you what was my closing statement, summarizing where I stand currently or we can look at individual images and talk about those. I leave that to the audience to decide because I don't want to, um, I don't want to hold you prisoner to my talk because I will. I had, I had some curiosity about the picture of your daughter when she wasn't feeling well and she's laying sideways. She didn't have pearls on. So they have, they have fallen and, you know, because I had, they were connected there and she was, um, she was doing that whole, I, you know, laying on the floor, I'm tired kind of thing. I'm going to read you the words that are on that one. Um, Harriet Jacobs. Her book is called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Um, it says, he told me I was his property, that I must be subject to his will in all things. My soul revolted against being tyranny, but where could I turn for protection? No matter whether the slave girl be black as ebony or as fair as her mistress. I'm going to go back to this. I'm gonna stop for a second, guys, and I'm gonna pull that image up so that it can be read with it. I hear Jones in my head again. No matter whether the slave girl be black as ebony or as fair as her mistress, in either case, there is no shadow of law to protect her from insult, from violence, or even from death. All these are inflicted by fiends who bear the shape of men. The mistress, who ought to protect the helpless victim, has no other feelings towards her but those of jealousy and rage. The degradation, the wrongs, the vices that grow out of slavery are more than I can describe. They are greater than you would willingly believe everywhere the years bring to all, sin and sorrow, but in slavery, the very dawn of life is destined by these shadows. So, you know, she, in this, the words that are highlighted is beauty proved to be her greatest curse. And then down here, it says, I belong to him. Meaning um, she was talking about, um, when she turned of age and she went to bed at night, she could hear the footfalls of her master and she slept trembling 
as she heard those footfalls. So those words fit India's picture. Yeah, I just don't see the I don't pearls. know where to go. From. And you still can't see the pearls. And you know, you're left to, when you stand in front of that image, um, two things, even I, who, you know, have seen all of my images multiple times, you stand in front of it and all of the portraits, the women are looking at you. Yeah. Everything's out of focus except just that eye, right? And they stare at you and you see them as human. Um, India is not looking at you. And you stand there and you're just like, open your eyes, open your eyes. I want to see your eyes. And so you're left to imagine what it is. And, you know, with each with each um, framed image, the words that go overlaid on it, that are overlaid on it are next to it. So you read the words, you look at the picture, you read the words, you look at the picture. Um, and those words, um, people react to that picture quite uh, differently. No one said, ever mentioned the fact that the pearls aren't there, but they aren't there. You're right. Pearl? Thanks for calling that out, Mark. Well, it's one of the things that I know I've heard other folks say, well, when you get home, the first thing you do is take off your pearls. Um, totally different connection has very little to do with uh, context, but um, that's what made me think. Uh, but when you go she... to bed. Yeah. So I was thinking, oh, she's sort of, this is repose, even though she doesn't have a pillow. So my mind went in a different direction than um, a recalcitrant teenager saying, mom, I don't want to do this. Don't make me do this, which is what your model was oh, sort of let doing. Me... Well, not this one. That's, that's that one at the uh. end. Um, the one that is laying down, um, she is, she just turned 28. There's uh. a big age gap. Um, she just turned 28. And, um, it wasn't that, you know, she was more, I am sick. And so she had curled into a pain, a repose of pain rather than rest. And I, I love the underlying tension that brings to the table. Um, and now that you say that, you know, how perfect it, it, it makes sense. When you go to bed, you don't sleep with your pearls on, right? Yeah. That's but I, I hadn't I hadn't made the connection and, and that's the crazy thing about this series things come out in it that's why I say the series seems to have a life of its own and, and it seems to tell its own story and times I feel like I'm running along and catching up to it early uh, early on uh, in this wonderful presentation you uh, you caught yourself, and it triggered something in, in, in my brain, like the synapses are old, but they work. Um, you started to say 23, and I filled it in by 23 and me. Did you use? Yes. Okay. Did you I use do 23 and 23 me? 23 and me. I use Ancestries. I can't think of the name um, for it. And then my, um, my daughter, Alicia, um, she did um, 23 and me and they matched everything tied up um, and and you can connect all uh, you can take 23 and me results and connect it with the ancestry DNA results and you know I'll go you up. I'll yeah. go you on further um, 23 and me is has such a vast I don't know a library right now around the world that um, uh, I, in fact, was able to find relatives from um, on my grandfather, on my paternal grandfather's side um, uh, from Russia that moved to Lithuania. So uh, uh, if anybody is interested in doing anything uh, like what Tony did in terms of finding out your, your relatives, I would strongly suggest getting a hold of 23andMe because it, they, they, they can trace the origins of your family by all the other people that have contributed to the DNA. It's incredible. It, it really is incredible. And you know, it's one of the things that I didn't think was going to be a passion within this project um, is that it has become a project. Like I'm very invested in, um, 
families researching their lineage. I'm very invested in people telling their stories and preserving those stories. I'm very invested in my community understanding and knowing the shoulders that we stand on and naming them. Like something that I do at the end of every show is I call out the names of my ancestors. I, um, and for those of you who are left, there is something that I really wanted to do and, and we can close with this maybe um, because it, it's a four minute video. Okay. Um, and the video closes out the presentation when it's a full formalized um, presentation. What this is, is a visual of uh, represented by colored dots. And the size of the dots are either small or large based on the number of slaves that were on the ship. They're colored based on the country that they represent. And so you have, um, it starts in the 1500s and it ends, I can't remember the date, but you'll see it. And at some point it begins to look like Africa is bleeding, right? The dots get so large and you start, it, you know, you can click on these links and you can see where the ship started, where it landed, how many slaves it picked up, where they ended up and how many slaves got off the ship. And so sometimes 400 slaves died on the crossing, 300, 200. Um, you can find out the ages, you can't find out the names. And then the ships that were caught once um, the slave trade was um, ruled illegal, um, you can then get the actual names of the people that were on these ships because the British, I think, who had captured them um, got all of their names. And so you see every single one, you learn the captain's name, all of it. So do you guys want to see that? Yep. Yeah, I think, we'll probably, like you said, we can end on that. So I want to thank you now. This has been really compelling and one of the most important conversations I think we've had here. I think many people will agree with that. There's a lot of thank yous in the chat. I will save the chat for you. Thank you, because, yeah, I can't read them. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say thank you to all of you. I didn't realize, yeah, it's almost 3 o'clock. Um, when I did the presentation before, uh, you know, it was like an hour and a half long and the company had paid me for that. Well, then everybody stayed for another two hours or three hours just <laughs> asking questions and talking and they sent me another check for that. Oh. And I was like, you didn't have to pay me. I mean, yay me, <laughs> right? But I was more... As you guys can see, I started out nervous. I'm no longer nervous. Now it's just like I'm looking at all these notes in front of me and I'm like, oh, I forgot to tell you this. I forgot to show you this. I should show you this. Um, but I'll save that for a proper presentation. I mean, this was a proper, you, you know what I mean? Yes. Um, so I want to say thank you um, to you guys for staying on, for listening, for asking questions. Where's Michael? He, there you are. Michael, I, I watched other ones and you always ask questions in each of them and, and I appreciate that. Um, and for those who aren't asking questions, um, my email is tonylovejoy at mac.com, T-O-N-I-L-O-V-E-J-O-Y at mac, maryapplecarrot.com. You can email me any questions I am that person that you can ask anything to. I might have thoughts in my head like you're an idiot, but I would never say that to you. <laughs> um, what else? I will still answer you, right? I will still answer you because I too can be an idiot at any given moment. Ask As we all in can. My family. Yeah. So you can call me. My phone number is on my website. My name is lovejoy.com. You can email me through there if you don't write it down. I'm doing a sales pitch. Follow me on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I'm you guys glad are we're Instagram still smiling people. and laughing. It's been Tony. Yeah. Tony, uh, you know, Africa is a huge continent. And we always talk about it 
are the slaves coming from Africa West. But um, you're going to see where they came from. Slaves went to the north to Europe and slaves went you're going to the... see that. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, you're going to see that. Uh, I'm um, curious where you, where you were able to get that from. Uh, you asking me that right now? My brain no, is no, telling no, you. No, don't okay. worry about it. Because I'm like, I don't know. I got it from somewhere. Uh, I can look. <laughs> I'm just an old man asking questions. That's all. Don't worry. And I'm an old girl answering them. So <laughs> if I can, I will. Okay. Um, and you can email me later and I can share it with you. Like anything that I've read, um, I can share it with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, cool. Well, thank you. So you are welcome, John. Thank you for. Um, even asking me to do this. Sure. As I told you, I was nervous. Like <laughs> I look at other people that you've had on here and I'm like, I'm not worthy, um, but I love my story. I love this series and I'll talk about it till the cows come home. Great. Okay, here we go. So here's Africa. This is a little bit hard. Here are the colors. And if you can't read it on your screen, Portugal and Brazil is red. Great Britain is blue, France is green, Spain is purple, the Netherlands are orange, the USA is yellow, Denmark is brown, and then there's another kind of pink right here that is other. So you see Portugal was the hugest, and then Britain. What about the Saudi US Arabia? Is not, they would probably be in other. Okay. But they were not, if they were practicing, so this is, a video that is showing the slip, the transit, the, the ships, the transit Atlantic slave ship. Okay. This is so, not showing destination though. It's showing the owner of the ship. Yes, it is. Oh, okay. It's showing destination as well, but you'll see a lot of them land here in Cuba. And then it, it, what happens is it doesn't show Cuba and Brazil, uh, not Brazil, Cuba. It will show a lot in Brazil. Cuba's
It's amazing. Yes, it's still going. Um, so this is what I say in closing. As I worked through this series, I, I was very angry. Um, and then I wrote this. I find that my anger serves, oh, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> like I was all serious getting ready to read this and then it goes again and I laugh. I find that my anger serves no purpose except to keep me in bondage. To release the anger is the beginning of taking back my power. I find to stand in the presence of anger and live there limits my ability to think, act, and be a woman of power. Anger to me is a feeling of powerlessness. We can own our power. We can take our power back by the very act of moving Sorry, I had to change, move this up. By the very act of moving up and lifting one another up, sharing knowledge, redefining the nature of our relationship with one another within the community. Self-love brings about community love. We are living the lie that slavery perpetuated, the lie that we are not good enough, smart enough, beautiful enough, fabulous enough. We compete against one another. All those things come from the lies of slavery. We can choose to not be victims and instead be victors. We no longer need to look outside of our community for acceptance. Once we accept one another within our community and lift one another up, we become the powerful people we were always meant to be. While we are a product of slavery, we can discard the myths of who we are and the stories that do not belong to us. In order to do that, we must know our history. We must know the lies that have been told and deeply embedded in us. And we must then tell the real story, expose the lie, shine a light in the darkness. It is important to know whose shoulders you stand upon. We can write a new future that does not include the lies and brutality that we carry with us like a cloak of honor, like the coat of many colors. We can let go of that. We do not have to dress it up and make it ours. We do not need to use the words of slavery and honor those who enslaved our ancestors. We need to use words that honor our ancestors who withstood, who stood up in spite of, who rose up in spite of, who survived in spite of. The air is thick with history, the horror, the very ground we walk on is soaked in the blood, sweat, and tears of our ancestors. So I chose differently. I chose to show beauty instead of horror, power instead of poverty. Thank you, guys.